Hello everybody and welcome to this video in which I'm going to talk about the principles of compliance, also known as the principles of conformity or the principles of persuasion. But you can read all about these in Cialdini's book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion. I'm going to, sh uh, I'm going to show you a, a picture of the front of the book in case you're interested. In fact, I just bought it myself this morning on the Kindle but, uh, 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 app. Now, let's get to it. I'm going to pull up my visual aid. Bought the book because I've read about these principles of compliance for years and it, I saw that he had a book and I was like, really? How do I not have this book? And so now I have it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> all right. So principles of compliance. First, we're going to talk about each of these principles and then talk about how these get used to uh, get people to buy things or uh, um, sorry I um, thought I shared my screen with you let me it's not looking like I did hold on one second let me try to share it again I hope it's sharing um, <clears throat> So, um, these principles of compliance can be used to sell people things, and often they are, but they also can get people to, in general, just agree to certain requests. So, we're going to talk about each principle, and then we're going to talk about some of the techniques, sales techniques, uh, persuasion tactics that use or operate each of these principles. So, let's first talk about the principle of reciprocity or uh, reciprocation. We are taught our whole lives, and there's some work suggesting that it's almost innate, to uh, engage in reciprocal behavior. What that means is, is if you do something for me, I do something for you, all right? You do me a favor, then I feel like I owe you a favor, right? Um, and it may not, and, it, and there may be a general sense of reciprocity. So, you know, that the whole pass it forward kind of thing, if I'm going to do you, uh, do something for you, then you don't necessarily have to do something for me, but do something for somebody. All right, <clears throat> so this is the principle of reciprocity or reciprocation. Um, and a couple techniques uh, for uh, sales operate off of this principle. For example, the that's not all technique. All right, then that's not all technique in, involves um, <clears throat> trying to get somebody to buy something, but then telling them, wait, that's not all you'll get. You'll also get X, Y, and Z. So when they add these additional things, this X, Y, and Z, these extra gifts, uh, buy now and you'll get this additional gift. You'll get two of, you know, whatever. Uh, then these additional things seem like they're being given to you. In fact, many times people will say, you'll get this additional thing for free. So it sounds like they're giving it to you, right? And so as I mentioned before, the principle of reciprocity, the norm of reciprocity is that when somebody gives you something, you give something back. And so <clears throat> um, the that's not all technique takes advantage of that norm, right? If you buy this thing, I'll give you these other things. So please buy this and I'll give you these things. Well, in reciprocity for giving those gifts, you go ahead and agree or you feel compelled to go ahead and agree to the request. The door in the face technique also takes uh, advantage of this uh, norm of reciprocity. Um, so the door in the face technique involves <clears throat> uh, somebody first giving you a very big request, a request that you're, you will almost assuredly say no to, right? And then they scale it back. So when you say no to the first big request, they scale it back, right? They make a smaller request. Well, when they reduce the request, oftentimes that feels to us like they're giving us something, like they're giving up something. And that activates that norm of reciprocity. It makes us more inclined to submit, or not submit, but to agree, to acquiesce to the smaller request. All right, so they hit you in the, in the face with that door of a huge request. When you say no, which they expect you to, they back off and they give you a smaller request. And because it feels like they've given you something, you feel more inclined to give them something, to acquiesce or agree to their request. So that's one of the principles of uh, compliance. Another is the principle of scarcity, 
All right. <clears throat> um, I'm making this video right after the uh, the big uh, outbreak of COVID-19, and we saw people just running through uh, the uh, grocery stores and taking, you know, water. The big the, the big item was toilet paper. Um, bleach was gone for weeks. Cleaning a lot of cleaning items were gone for weeks. Why? Well, because they were being told these things are in short supply. These things are disappearing. These things are becoming scarce. And those who jumped on it in the first place maybe and likely anticipated that they would become scarce. All right. And so when we become uh, aware that something is scarce, something is rare, we become uh, almost compelled to snatch it up. All right. This is why a lot of sales campaigns do that available for a limited time, right? So the McRib, right? Used to be, and uh, it may still be, but I'm not certain, um, only out for a certain period each year, right? Well, it, that makes it available for a limited time, okay? A lot of times people will pay high prices, high, top dollar for rare uh, pieces of art, for rare, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of it. I uh, have a goal of buying the first, uh, the comic book in which Dr. Doom made his first appearance. That's an expensive comic. And right now, way outside of my ability to afford, but I plan to get it eventually. And the reason people can charge so much is because it's scarce. Look at any book when it goes out of print, look at any product when it quits being made. If you can find them online, like on eBay, for example, once something goes out of print or quits being made, its price goes up. Um, the masks, again, in the COVID-19 quarantine time, the masks uh, started being snatched up and used quite frequently. And so people started price gouging. Now, luckily, a lot of governments made, uh, went out and started making anti-price gouging uh, legislation, but they were able to do that and people were willing to pay for it. Not necessarily happy about it, but they were willing because of this principle of scarcity. When we get the idea that something is rare or scarce, we get we become more inclined to purchase it. The principle of authority. <clears throat> Humans are social creatures, and most social creatures develop hierarchies. Um, when a leader or someone higher in the hierarchy uh, tells us to do something, most of us, most people on this planet feel inclined to do that thing. And even if they don't necessarily tell us to do it, they suggest it. If somebody higher in the hierarchy tells us, hey, you, you might do this thing, right? Then <clears throat> we feel inclined to do it, all right? This is why things like celebrity endorsements and expert endorsements work. Why? Well, experts have established themselves at least in the hierarchy of knowledge, they have established their expertise in a field, right? <clears throat> Celebrities, however, are kind of taking advantage of a visibility effect. So we tend to think that things that are more visible are more important. Um, this includes people. We tend to think that people are more people who are more visible are more important. Celebrities are more visible. And so we tend to think of celebrities as occupying a higher status in that social and that status hierarchy. Um, we tend to think of them as, we, we may never say to ourselves, oh yeah, they're more important than a regular person, but we certainly treat them that way um, <clears throat> on average. Um, you're probably not going to buy a, an industry probably isn't going to do so well writing about gossip about your three next door neighbors' love lives, but tons of newspapers make bank of uh, writing about gossip of uh, celebrity, celebrities love lives, lo celebrities love lives. Um, so when a celebrity, so therefore, because celebrities kind of, we kind of operate like celebrities are higher in the status hierarchy, status hierarchy and the economic status hierarchy, many of them certainly are higher uh, in the status hierarchy, but because we treat them as such, we tend to treat them like authorities. So when they suggest something, we feel inclined to do that thing. Um, when experts suggest something, we feel inclined to do that thing. So <clears throat> this is why we see celebrity and 
uh, celebrity endorsements for products. Uh, so I think Shaq is a celebrity endorsement for, uh, I don't remember the actual car insurance brand name, but it's got the general uh, as their little, ma as their mascot, um, but that's a celebrity endorsement. Um, <clears throat> when you see pharmaceutical commercials, you've got a doctor uh, promoting it. Um, so the, these endorsements work because of the principle of authority. The next principle is the principle of commitment and consistency. Specifically, we once we uh, have done something, we feel committed to it. And if we, once we've done something, not continuing to do that thing feels inconsistent. And one of our uh, fundamental motives is to feel consistent. It's the, it's the fundamental motive of, proposed by cognitive dissonance theory, one of the most uh, successful theories in all of psychology. <clears throat> so when things make us feel inconsistent, we want to fix that. And so two uh, uh, persuasion or compliance techniques that take advantage of that is the foot in the door technique and the lowballing technique. So, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the foot in the door technique involves getting you to agree to a small request first, and then once you've agreed to that small request, making a second slightly larger request, all right? So once you've agreed, oh, there's a picture of that book, Influence by Cialdini that I was talking, I was talking about earlier. Sorry, tangent. Anyway, back to it. Um, once you've agreed to that first smaller request, when they make that smaller request, that second small, uh, small additional request, to say no to that second request feels almost inconsistent. And because of that inconsistency, and because we don't want to feel inconsistent, we're inclined to agree to that second request. Sometimes people can take this far and you know, ask a, ask a, a, make a third request, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. Um, <clears throat> and when that happens and people agree to the, more, the, the greater requests, they're succumbing to the foot in the door technique. Another technique known as lowballing is a technique that takes advantage of that. And you see this oftentimes with uh, uh, car salesmen. In fact, you see a lot of these with car salesmen. Um, <clears throat> the lowballing technique is when they get you to agree to purchase something for a acceptable amount, all right? So, you know, you might say, well, I'm, I go to the car dealership. I can only pay so much. I can only pay this amount. So they find you a car in which you can pay that amount or slightly over, all right? Then they get you to sign all this paperwork, making you feel committed to the decision. Then they start adding on things, all right? Well, you're gonna have to pay for this, you pay for this, you pay for this, you can pay for this and you pay for this. If you don't pay for this, it's a bad idea, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> They've got you to agree to something. They've gotten you to commit to it. And now they're making additional requests. Well, these additional requests saying no to them feels inconsistent with the first decision you made, all right, which fit well into your parameters, all right. <clears throat> Uh, the, the rules that you might have set for yourself about what you can and cannot buy, right? So they're taking advantage of that sense of commitment and consistency, all right? That's the technique, lowball. Now, another uh, principle is the pr principle of consensus. And this goes back to, uh, and probably why this is, this is often included in uh, the conformity chapter of social psych textbooks rather than the persuasion chapter. Um, <clears throat> But the principle of consensus uh, operates on the, the uh, mechanism by which we want to do what most people are doing, all right? We want to engage in uh, uh, normative behavior. If you recall from another video, normative focus theory is Cialdini's theory, all right? <clears throat> so again, he argues that if you focus on a particular norm, you're going to be inclined to behave in accordance with that norm. So when things bring you, make you aware of a normative behavior, it inclines you to behave in a manner consistent with that norm. So you tend to be inclined to behave in a way that's consistent with the consensus, with what most people are doing. So this is why we see advertisements like best-selling truck in Oklahoma, or best-selling truck in Texas, or best-selling whatever in wherever, 
all right? That's conveying to you, hey, the majority of people are doing this. It's conveying to you a descriptive norm. And <clears throat> it's highlighting that descriptive norm, right? And again, back to Cialdini's other theory, the theory of norm, uh, normative focus theory, all right? Bringing your attention to that makes you inclined to uh, conform to it. That's why we see things like OKC's first uh, number one burger joint or number one Italian place or number one whatever. All right. Again, number one conveys that the majority of people prefer it, that the majority of people are doing it. That again activates that uh, focus on the descriptive norm and inclines you to behave in a manner consistent with it. Going to that burger joint, buying that truck. All right. And finally, the principle of liking. Uh, the principle of liking simply refers to the fact that we, uh, we want to belong to groups. And so we tend to want to do things for group, the groups that we want to belong to. And we tend to want to belong to groups that we like, all right? So when we like someone, we tend to want to do things for them. This is part of the reason why uh, the servers that get the biggest tips are the friendly ones. This is why every car, every successful, successful car dealer that you've ever met, or at least the vast majority of them, are super friendly. All right. Um, certainly, I have a relative who's a car dealer, and this guy can make almost anybody like him, and he's pretty successful at what he does. <clears throat> For that. In, uh, for that reason. We tend to want to do things for the ones we like, all right? So there you go. There are uh, six principles of compliance. Now, uh, I mentioned at the bottom, I've included at the bottom the importance of mindlessness. S uh, specifically, what I'm talking about is, in general, these principles are more effective when we're mindless, all right? And so <clears throat> sometimes, again, car dealerships, will take advantage of this. And so sometimes when you go to sign the papers where you're starting to negotiate, right? Other car dealers will come into the room with you, all right? And they'll start talking to you, all right? And the point of that is, the, and I don't know if they do it, they mean to uh, do it for this reason, but what that does is it prevents you from thinking about the deal, right? Because you're having to talk to them, right? Or at least you feel obliged to talk to them. Well, as long as you're talking to them, you can't think about the negotiation process. Now, certainly you can act like a jerk, right? And ignore them, tell them, hey guys, I need you to leave, I gotta think. Um, they're still gonna try and talk to you, all right? They, they gotta make a sale, right? And the more they can get, get you to pay, the more money they make, right? <clears throat> so they're gonna still try, but we don't wanna be jerks, right? We want to be talked, we want to talk, to them. We want to be friendly. We want to feel like they like us. And so we won't. We oftentimes won't tell them to leave. We will engage with them. But when we engage with them, we can't think. It makes us mindless. And so all of those principles of compliance tend to work better because we're not thinking about it. So mindlessness simply refers to the fact that when we're not carefully thinking about our own behavior, carefully thinking about what we're doing, those principles of compliance, those things that lead us or incline us to behave in a certain way, they're more effective. So all those techniques are more effective when we're mindless. We can, tend, we can do a better job of shutting them down, not succumbing to them when we're thinking carefully. All right. And there you go. Uh, um, hopefully this will all help you the next time you go buy a car. Uh, but um, that is it for this video on the principles of compliance slash conformity slash persuasion. As always, if you have any questions, send them my way. If not, I hope you have a great week, and I'll see you all later on.